Hello and welcome to my view from the piano bench. We do this on Wednesday evenings here in my Joel Holtz Notes YouTube channel. In addition to piano for my friends on Thursday evening. On Wednesday evening I have a topic, a uh, item of interest or maybe uh, musical construction or uh, experience that I think might be interesting to talk about and hopefully you find that to be true. Thank you for the feedback that you give me. Thank you to those of you who support and encourage me. Through the links you'll find on the support page of my website you'll see a link to that page in the video description. On Thursday evenings I let myself be ridiculous and spontaneous with a cocktail hour style piano. You probably know the drill and uh, Thanks for your consideration, if you haven't to this point, uh, to a drop in the tip jar that sponsors these videos. So let's move on. So I knew what I was going to talk about until just a few minutes before starting this. I got myself into a bit of a YouTube rabbit hole. I allow that to happen. Uh, it's a complicated issue for me. Uh, time management, complicated may be the wrong word, uh, challenging issues sometimes, uh, allowing the spontaneity while keeping myself inside of structure. So short little dips in the rabbit holes, uh, not big long ones, and watched a couple of YouTube videos that take a lot of time. But the second one was a jazz pianist. I have not seen his YouTube channel before, but he has a ton of subscribers, so he's obviously, you know, uh, doing something. I mean, over a million. Uh, and the title of the video was The Greatest Pianist I Was Never Taught About. The Greatest Jazz Pianist I Was Never Taught About. And it's funny that I didn't conclude immediately who he was talking about. I, and there's a reason why, which is related to all this. He was talking about Oscar Peterson. And mm, to consider him the greatest jazz pianist and make that a broad category uh, is not entirely common among musicians, among jazz musicians, especially among academia. And that was his point. Uh, and by the end of the video, I was reminded of a phrase that I often use, and it was one that I surprised myself by using in a comment on this video, and I seldom comment on YouTube videos. You know, for me, doing anything with words that isn't spontaneous, uh, stream of consciousness talking like this, mm. is, uh, can be a painstaking process. But I knew what I wanted to say, uh, w which is, that you know, jazz academia tends to want to what I call listen with a scorecard as opposed to listening with your heart. And then I said, if you listen with your heart, Oscar Peterson hits a home run. And it's like, okay, what I wanted to talk about is going to be put on hold because this is right now really clear in my head. Listening with a scorecard. Who? Uh, what? What a subject and what a... Uh, mm, concise way of talking about how jazz is understood often and approached by jazz musicians and why jazz isn't popular anymore and why it used to be. So let's see if I can make sense of this. And it's also a little late in the day. I got some other things done before I did this and then had my little rabbit hole, not a long one, but you know, let's see if my brain is still working enough to talk about this. Oh, yeah, I can't forget, can I? So, the idea of listening to music analytically, it's kind of understood as the curse of being a musician. But I've learned that it's not entirely or always true, not necessarily true, and we should aspire to it being not true. Or at least I do at this point. But I would always advise students that 
when they grow as a musician, the way they listen to music is going to change. And I never really considered it was for the better or for the worse. It's just going to change because you're aware of what you're listening to now. You have more of an awareness of what's going on. And so you listen, you know, kind of kind of analytically or it, it, at least not entirely on an emotional level anymore until the day you decide or the day you realize you need to actually do that that was a specific day for me but in terms of in terms of jazz jazz is all about uh, in in the contemporary sense now the cool stuff that a jazz musician is doing the jazz vocabulary that's being exhibited. And jazz musicians can be often judged by their vocabulary. And this is where Oscar Peterson gets uh, a bum rap in a lot of jazz circles because he is not uh, speaking with that advanced hip vocabulary. And we've talked about this before, the whole hipper than thou thing. This is related to a conversation that I had at this past weekend's uh, swing dance gig uh, with uh, Craig Gildner, the guitar player, who you know, makes the point in a I don't understand why sense. And I feel like I do understand why. And it's like, you know, I just, this just goes without saying now. It's like, well, why don't they talk about the historic things in jazz and jazz education why does nobody learn about you know stride piano or, or or learn about the contributions of you know name a musician prior to you know bebop or try prior to the mid late 40s of course the person doesn't say bebop i say bebop because bebop vocabulary is what launches jazz into an academic discipline and when you go to college to study jazz, or you buy jazz books to study jazz, if you're somebody who connects with historic jazz, who connects with you know, Oscar Peterson or pianists that came before him, you're going to have an issue, or you're going to have, you know, pebbles in your shoe a little bit with jazz education, because you're going to be taught to interpret jazz, understand jazz, evaluate jazz, judge jazz by the contributions of Charlie Parker and people who came thereafter. Uh, is, are those contributions, you know, bad? No, they're great. But in terms of, of defining jazz and what came before Charlie Parker, it kind of doesn't count. Uh, in the academic realm to the point where you know some academics will say ridiculous things like the music prior to that is in jazz or Louis Armstrong and then they then they trip and you know have trouble because everybody realizes the necessity of recognizing Louis Armstrong but then you get a but but and uh but but then some contemporary jazz people will not do that and they will get it but it's like until we get to until we get to Charlie Parker, Dizzy Monk, and people who came thereafter, it's like it's not part of the organized discipline of the of the thing, and that has to do with what I call my PTSD that I've talked about, uh, because coming up in the mid and late seventies as a very young aspiring jazz musician. Uh, that was like really heavily tribal with younger people and and with older musicians too it's like if you weren't into chick and you weren't into you know all that stuff that was going on and you were actually you were actually listening to the benny goodman trio or do do, do it doing swing era stuff oh boy were you not hip it's it's better now it's better now uh just to some extent anyway but the idea of evaluating jazz by its content as opposed to by its impact 
it is you know the contemporary jazz musicians mm, uh, connection to their own tribe their own niche market i remember a long time ago back when i was in my early 20s and i uh, was involved in my own niche which was church related things uh, and i was developing my network of concerts that i would do in churches and they weren't all you know christian music concerts they were what i would call what i had called the roots of jazz piano you know kind of to be community concerts you know to 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 do concerts that would attract other people into to the church uh and my roots of jazz piano concerts uh were like you know fat swaller and, and people like that you know coming coming up historically and i remember in uh, our little like denominational magazine or something there there was an article about this and then i got uh, a message from a jazz musician in, in the denomination who was like well wait a minute and what he was saying without saying it is are you even playing jazz yeah, because it's like, well, don't you do this? I guess he heard a recording or something. And he was talking about these theoretical concepts that jazz musicians, you know, practice and, 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 and use and define their sound. Why jazz sounds like jazz, which is likewise, a lot of people don't like it, right? Uh, and, and he just kept throwing out things. I remember he got to what we would call substitute dominance. You know, so don't you even do that? Uh and the answer is yes, I do, but not, you know, not in the method or the way, you know, that you would construct it. And you're judging me by that. And you're like, you know, kind of tacitly telling me, you know, he's jazz and I'm not. Because I don't use these uh litmus test things in the way that he does which is very ironic as it strikes me right now coming from somebody in the they don't like the, that denomination doesn't like to call themselves evangelical but to talk about this in just the broad brush for people to understand we're going to call it evangelical and the conservative you know slash evangelical you know church you know when you know you're accused by everybody else of having this litmus test you know here's what you're going to do you're going to litmus test uh jazz musicians you're not a real jazz musician if you don't do this like you're not a real i don't want to go down a theological argument but and, and and i am kind of caricaturizing this on purpose because uh, this is not a talk about philosophy and religion, but it's like, you know, you're not a real Christian if you don't look at it like this. Right? Now, I'm going to get in trouble by some people for, 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 for saying that. So I'm saying that as an illustration, okay? And I said kind of a character-ish. Uh, and, we, and we get into this fundamentalistic, you know, thing. And the thing about art let's get back to that real quick the thing about art so i don't get in trouble is it is ultimately subjective and it is personal okay actually so was our connection with god okay. there's people people who tend to be very black and white very, you know, the way I understand this, the way everybody else has to understand it, you know, don't tend to be artists. They tend to be like, you know, lawyers and accountants and stuff because that, that's how their brain works. But you get caught in this sort of, sort of tribal thing and what I would call, especially historically in jazz, hipper than thou, uh, and the scorecard is listening for specific content, judging it by 
you know, what you, what you say or by the absence of saying things. I, I remember when uh, I was, for a time, I'm not doing it now, uh, leading the uh, jazz combo at Washington College uh, in, in Chestertown. I have I've moved on from that purposefully. Uh, and uh, there was someone on the faculty uh, who was, you know, new to the faculty, involved in, in jazz education. There's really not a jazz program there. And there was a recording of me, and a student told me later that he was really curious. That, oh, let me hear his solo. It's like, yeah, here we go. Here we go. You know, judge the guy. Judge the guy by, by, by his jazz vocabulary. And I didn't pass muster with him. Uh, uh, he never came out and said it, but it was obvious in the interactions. It was obvious by, by lots of things, you know. And I didn't care that he would not, you know, consider me a serious in the way he would look at serious a jazz pianist. Because I've moved away from using that word for myself because of people like that. Uh, and, and, and also b because of what jazz is. Right. Uh, and when I heard Dave McKenna say, as I get older, I consider myself more of a song player than a jazz player. It's really what he was speaking to, but he's also speaking honestly that the idea of uh, being the hippest guy in the room or, or, and that's pejorative. I don't mean it by that. Like there are people who, musicians who are really like, you know, Music theory nerds is, is, is what one educator says. Yeah, and it's like you're just drawn in by that. And, you know, you want the latest hip scale and the, la the latest. So I can't keep any of that straight. You know, I, I do have ways in which, you know, I feel I'm pushing out my harmonic envelope. I'm not, I'm not doing it that way. But ultimately, it's, 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 it's all about, you know, communicating from here. You know, and for me, playing the song, right? Uh, so the whole sort of judgment thing about, oh, you're not real because of this. And Oscar Peterson gets a lot of crap from a portion of jazz academia because it's, oh, he doesn't, you know, all he does is play blues scales. Well, that's not all he does. That's a lot of what he does or blues related things. But what does he do with uh, that vocabulary? Yeah, he uses a limited vocabulary, a more like colloquial vocabulary. And he says more with that <laughs> than so many, so many people, you know. Uh, and he speaks to a large, a much larger fan base. Oh, that's because he's not hip. Oh, no. It's because he communicates the soulfulness. And, and so what I wound up saying on that, that YouTube comment on that video, and I'll try to remember to post the video link in the description, uh, in, either in the description or the comments, probably the comments, uh, is uh, that you know, Jazz Academia has this... Uh, Scorecard, yeah, scorecard, listen with the scorecard. I told you I was a little tired. Uh, mentality, but if you listen to Oscar with your heart, he hits it out of the park, right? And, you know, Oscar is one of my heroes. I will admit that sometimes his, his note choices, particularly when it involves showboating, which he does, especially later on in his in, in his career. I prefer early Oscar, uh, in large part for that reason. It, you know, he he it's a little less autopilot sometimes, not entirely. And you know, I'm not making a making a sweeping judgment. <laughs> But 
Oscar can get really panned by Jazz Academia, but if and and you just say he just does repetitive stuff with limited vocabulary, but he speaks with that intense soul through every little little nuance and every ounce of his ridiculous technique. To me, that's what makes Oscar special, right? That 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 with all that technique he has, he speaks from here, and and that's that's the roots of jazz. What 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 is felt? There's an there is, and you can analyze Oscar, but you can only analyze Oscar to a point. Then you like run out of things to analyze, and then you, then if all it is is about analysis, you have to go on to you know some more cerebral player to get to get more analysis and then you say oh it's all about the analysis well no oscar is not a lesser player because in the end he had a bigger bigger audience than most no it's because he was on to something and he and he, and, and he spoke with the more colloquial vocabulary but he spoke volumes with that vocabulary right and that you know Jazz Academia is not going to agree with me. You know, uh, so, so somebody like Eric Cohen has is, is kind of found a magical balance. Uh, and I, I respect what he's done in, in, in staying with the history of jazz, playing historic things, uh, being, being true to that, uh, you know, channeling people like Oscar Peterson, but also using his vocabulary not as a uh, mm, not as not as a line in the sand, but as part of his as part of his package, right? So I remember uh, when I was receiving jazz instruction. You know, uh, I would hear unflattering things about Oscar because it didn't fit the litmus test. But I don't fit the litmus test either. Uh, but a lot of uh, jazz is taught by people with the emphasis on the scorecard. And when the student, and years ago it was me, it, it, it is, is more inclined to respond to, you know, music, music that speaks to their heart, like Oscar did the first time I heard him, or, or like what I heard from Oscar on recording uh, before that. There can be a, it can create some confusion, it can create some, some soul searching. And, you know, and I was really torn by both sides of the 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 camp of, of jazz you know is is, is is jazz about you know the artistic elevated attainment you know that people who are authorities in jazz are most qualified to judge and you hang the piece of uh, you know the artwork up in the museum uh metaphorically in terms of jazz of course uh and then if people walk by it oh well you know they don't get it too bad they're not hip people who are hip like me get it and we have our little wonderful tribe and we congratulate each other and it can be a badge of honor that we that, that we do you know a show in a, a, a small club and we're famous famous if you're jazz pianist and 40 people come to hear us you know, now I'm being a little cynical, all right? Because, of course, I'm not a famous musician. I don't purpose to be. Uh, I purpose to connect with the people around me. And, you know, especially in, in, in my older age, a lot more, a lot more realism, you know, uh, uh, about it. But is there a place for me? Sure there is.
listening with a scorecard. So what are we keeping score of? Well, years ago, uh, a wonderful uh, local musician, uh, woman, songwriter, who really took a liking to me, uh, made a, a comment on, before there was Facebook, I, on one of my uh, blog posts, which, which I started that, you know, well before I got into Facebook. And she had this big long thing about why I was one of her favorite musicians, and she said at the end, when you listen to Joe, listen with your heart. And I loved that. And if you go to my testimonial page of my, my website, you, uh, under the listeners say, as opposed to the colleagues say, I think it's what I, the word I used. Uh, and I chose listeners over fans. Because, you know, I, I, that's like, I'm ascribing like, you know, a label to people who you know, might want to call themselves fans. You know, but but the the unarguable common thread of anybody who comments on what they hear is they listen to me. So listeners say one of the top ones when you listen to Joe, listen with your heart. And you know, the ironic thing is that I didn't understand that for the longest time. I mean, I did, but I didn't because I didn't know what listening from your heart really was. Especially early on when I was, you know, judging myself for not having uh, a really understanding of, you know, jazz vocabulary and not thinking that way. So taking jazz lessons in my 20s, and I did that intently for three years with a very respected local slash regional uh, jazz musician, who's a jazz academic, who uh, chairs a department in jazz, I think. Uh, been a, you know, music academy, conservatory, college instructor for a long time. And I really, really struggled to use the vocabulary to like go with the scorecard and I would practice you know the the scale chord thing and 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 the bebop vocabulary and and, and all this stuff but I couldn't make a stick and I couldn't here's something interesting and I realizes, but it's main, meaning something to be di different to me right this minute when I'm talking, that, yeah, I was real busy and gigging and everything. It didn't have a lot of practice time, but I couldn't make sufficient practice time. I would do it, but, but, but not so much, you know, and I, 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 I couldn't make it, I couldn't make it work and I couldn't make those concepts work because ultimately I understand that now my playing is it's not cerebrally based and in in this person's approach there is always an intellectual component to it you know for me I have to forget everything I know in order to in order to really express but you know it wasn't until till later in life and part of this part of this is the ability to have more time you know, when I when I was at a point where the pressure of earning on me was a little less, and earning you know a fair amount of money for me involves gigging like crazy. So I've got no time. I'm I'm out early in the morning. I'm home late at night, and that happens all the time. And it, it, uh, but I don't even know that I would have used the time to really like practice like I should to the amount I should. If I had it then, uh, but 
now, especially now, prioritizing that practicing. There's another YouTube video. There's two YouTube, video, YouTube videos I watch in this rabbit hole. I didn't spend a ton of time with it, but they were two different subjects. And, you know, the idea was I might post one or the other. Uh, one was the one I'm mentioning. The other that I watched before that, interestingly, so I wasn't really relating it to, but now I am, was how much time do the famous classical pianists actually practice? Of course, it's very different. But for, for many of them, four hours a day is a minimum. For some of them, it's extreme. So the range of all the you know, famous classical musicians, composers, and pianists that this person, I thought about sharing this too, but it's, I don't know, uh, is between two and 14 hours a day, right? Uh, but, you know, the, the, the great musicians who've really broken through, at least in some period of their, of their life, uh, have had this time when they practiced, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. I was having this conversation with someone today about, was it Sonny Rollins? Uh, I think it was Sonny Rollins. Uh, but, you know, and, and, and part of that is just like appropriating the vocabulary. But it's, it's all, all the musical elements, whether, whether you're classical or you're jazz. You know, and, you know, and the, the, the woman, and of course, she was talking about classical pianists, but she's right that pianists tend to be, you know, kill cagey about admitting how much they practice because it is a private thing, you know, and the, the goal, and I, and I make the goal, typically, you know, the, now, because in the pandemic, I could do four hours a day, and I should have done more. And sometimes I did. I'm talking about on average. It, you know, now if I can average two to three hours a day, at least over six days, and give myself a day off, a week, you know, I, I, I figure I'm doing well. Do I want more? I absolutely do. But, you know, for, for me, the, the, the practicing is not about the scorecard. It's just about being more expressive with what I have, which when it gets deep uh, with me, mindlessly deep, intuitively deep, you know, I, I think there are some elements of, of somebody's scorecard that probably do get checked. But I've learned, and I'm a much deeper musician now, to learn to actually listen to the way, the way Grace was stand encourage people to listen to me with my heart. And, you know, when you really impact a lot of people, is when you speak to their hearts. And it's not because you're dumbing down what you do. It's because that's who you are. You know, and, and it's, it's a controversial subject. I think I told you, told you this. The uh, uh, department chair of the college I went to. Uh, and I, you know, I, I took me a lot of years to graduate there. I was hunting around there a lot because I was a part-time student. You know, I... I went full-time my first freshman year, dropped out, gig full-time for a couple of years, and then came back part-time and continued to, to gig full-time, you know, at, as a musician, gig and teach, and, and do the college in the cracks. And, I, and I've always had, had stuff like that. You know, I could, I could say that even when I was uh, practicing music therapy full-time, and I would count that as gigging during the day, that's why I could say 600 gigs a year, but... I was still gigging full time, you know, as, as, as a musician. When I was half time, you know, 20 hours a week paid for uh, uh, on, the, on the church staff as worship arts director, I was still gigging full time. You know, that, that's, that's always been how I've, I've self identified. <laughs> aspiring to 
get deeper and then eventually realize that that emotional connection is it while I seek to elevate you know the vocabulary of, 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 of my playing but from that from that emotional space <laughs> back to what the majority I think or at least the open-minded jazz academia will give credit to the jazz traditions for and call it legit for because it was about how the music was felt and it's understood now you know we're, we're talking about music with 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 the roots and uh, the black American experience right and if it's not felt, you know, if it's not from here, you know, all the amount of vocabulary nerdness isn't going to make it sound good. So I love this video. You can look it up uh, on YouTube on the Open Studio uh, channel uh, department. <laughs> I want to I want to use another name enterprise or or, or something, but it's, it's it's jazz education and a lot of it for pianists and there's one video called Why Do I Still Suck, right? And it's an acknowledgement that you know your what he calls rhythmic vocabulary has to be strong, right? In order for whatever your harmonic vocabulary is to even communicate something, and he acknowledges that, and I've always said this, that what's, what's more important, the time or the notes? It's the time. Because you can, you can play really solid time with funny notes. And you might notice there are funny notes, but man, it still feels really good. It still make you smile. You can play like all the great notes in the world with weird time, and you're just like, what? What? Yeah. Uh, I have to refigure this out again, but back in, when I was doing this video with another title, uh, I purposely took Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and screwed up the rhythm so much and I plotted it out so I could play it and you wouldn't know it was Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Like I turned the phrases around and, and reharmonized it to, to kind of hide it even more. Because I always would say, but I never actually tried to back it up with doing something, I, I would always say that you could, you know, take the most familiar tune and play it rhythmically wrong and, had, and you wouldn't have a clue what the tune was. And that is, that is true. And, you know, what makes, what makes early jazz so important was that it was bringing the vocabulary of Western music into the rhythmic feel you know and yeah that vocabulary continued to sort of evolve but at a certain point it became so much about the vocabulary that you know now there are fra fragments of jazz that try to kind of you know what they say europeanize it more because it's really just now about the vocabulary <laughs> So it's a funny matter. Oh, that's where I was, where I was going my, in, in college. My, I was friends with the department chair. I was saying why I was in college for a long time. I was setting up that, you know, I was just casually going there. I wasn't in a hurry to finish. I finished eight and a half years after I started. You know, uh, I remember getting a letter of recommendation from my the department chair. It was, it was very much, you know, very much an encourager to me. And he would just call me a, a non-traditional student is I, I guess what I was but we would have lots of you know little conversations and he would have lots of little sayings you know which were meaningful and but what one was like not an encouragement but still largely true remember Joe musicians are but the servants of the wealthy 
in a historical context, that's certainly true. Uh, you know, in a pop music, I want to be a star context, it's a whole different thing. But he's talking about the realities of just be, being in there and, and doing it. But one time we were listening to a, uh, a, uh, a jazz pianist in the recital hall together, and somebody sing your recital, a fellow, fellow pianist, uh, not a fellow, a jazz musician from the outside, uh, who I knew very well, uh, and had come in to help out in somebody's singing recital. And he was going on this tear and about doing all this, this stuff. And the, the point that my friend of the department chair made, who was not a jazz musician, but a jazz, he got it, you know, and, and, and he really appreciated me. And uh, he, he used two words to dismantle you know, what all of the harmonic things that the listening with a scorecard person would say is so cool that, wow, wow, had nothing to do with the song. Nothing to do with the piece, really. It had to do with, with, with that moment, doing something because you can. I remember somebody, uh, it, uh, the drummer, or the, I don't know, in Bran Branford Marsalis' band uh, recently, uh, in the last few years, would say about him that he's kind of unique because uh, he's really into the emotional content of the song as opposed to most you know, jazz players who just use whatever the song is as an opportunity to, to, to do things because they can. Right? And that really has, that kind of summarizes this. It's like, oh, wow, wow, wow. I want to learn that cool thing. You know? Uh, well, my 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 friend the the the, the, the pianist the uh you know hipper hipper than now he wouldn't like me saying that about him but yeah the hipper than now pianist does this tear i you know and the two works part material leans over to me and says harmonic grandstanding i will tell you and i, I realize this at the time that I, I could see the alarm bells going off in the room of the hipper than now crowd. Because, you know, if I were to walk into a room and say harmonic grandstanding, there is not such a thing. Well, you know, if you, if you, if you do something to show that you can, or you're not grandstanding, you know, this particular pianist who harmonic grandstanding was being said, you know, used to describe him, was actually, could be really, like, pointedly, well, vicious is the wrong word, but, you know, was willing to point out technical grandstanding of, you know, certain musicians over, over substance. Not really jazz musicians, per se. Liberace-esque players, not Liberace himself, but People who like just get into the whole thing and you're just being all flowery and you're doing all this stuff. But then, then what are you actually saying? And there's the absolute point to that. And, and, and Oscar, to me, can grandstand. And his grandstanding, when he, when he does, you know, the autopilot stuff, because he can, and then he goes back to playing and his groove and stuff, you know, that takes away from it for me. That's why I told you. I like, I, I like earlier Oscar. Uh... So it's like, oh, you can't grandstand. It's not just about technique. It's about what you play. Yes, it is. But I would never say to this person harmonic grandstanding. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I don't feel the need to. I don't need to excuse. It was just interesting that it was said to me about that. Because I think that is valid. Totally valid. But but what what are you what are you, what's the result of grandstanding? You know what are you taking away from? You're taking away from ultimately the emotional content. You know the the the, the meaning of of, of 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 the song. And you know my two friends of very opposing you know positions would use Beethoven as an example of their position. <laughs> it was funny, you know. Uh, my harmonic grandstanding friend uh, w would 
say that, you know, Beethoven was pushing the envelope throughout his life about, you know, what he was doing musically and harmonically, and he didn't care. His point is he didn't care about how the public reacted because he knew the value of what he was doing. He, he, he knew that it was good. Why? Because he was, I guess, you know, he and other anointed people could pronounce it good. And if people didn't get it, fine. And because, like, at the end of his life, people would walk out of his concerts because it's like, I don't like this. And, you know, and I remember, you know, some some more uh, contemporary jazz musicians were booked as the mainstay. We had a, a program director at one point who was inclined to book a lot more contemporary jazz, and our audience was balking, you know. But, you know, he, his idea was, you know, we're going to expose to this and we're going to, we're going to, basically going to allow it to grow on you and you're going to accept it we're going to educate you kind of thing uh, uh a good portion of our audience did not appreciate that and I, mean, I would stay through half the concert and walk out i remember one very noteworthy uh saxophone player and a friend of mine still talks about oh i couldn't take that and i just i just i just walked out and <laughs> Okay, and my her, my listen with a scorecard friend would, would say that is to the musician's credit, and I could see that. Yeah, you know, like I'm being true to my statement, and I'm going to play to a room at the end of the show that has twelve people that may have started out with a lot more, because I'm true. I'm true to my thing. It's a complicated subject, but. That's the measure of the artist's integrity. You know, you hang that in the museum, and, and the people who know it's good know it's good. And I, res I respect that, really. Uh, but... My department chair friend, who coined the term to me, uh, harmonic grandstanding, would say about Beethoven, you know, he pushed the envelope, and when he was pushing the envelope, people walked. They walked out of his concerts. But by the time he died, by the end of his life, he had actually moved that listening audience to the point where they were embracing what he did. It took time, but he moved. He, he, he pushed that envelope so that he got a hero's funeral by the time he died. In other words, he reached the public. You know, uh, and it's like, what is, but, but he, he reached them and he elevated them. So yes, I paradoxically am saying that, you know, when, when you do more like creative things, you do elevate the scene, of course, of, of course you do. It's a complicated subject, but uh, in 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 the end, yeah. And I was on both camps, and then the more I realized that I'm here to live my life from my heart and not from my head. Not from my judgments, not from my evaluations, but from the deepest place I can find. But I know as an artist, I have to continue to grow that place and to get deeper. But be conscious of everybody around me and offer it. And not be cold and callous to, well, you're just, you know, you're not hip. I don't have use for you. No. Well, then I'm not hip either. I'm hip. I oh, yeah, well, want some Deary tune. Sharon and I may record that someday. Or Dave Fishberg tune. Uh, I don't even remember. There's a lot, lot, lot of major sevens. Yeah, the, the, the tune I'm hip, you look it up, is, is written in jazz speak hip vocabulary. Because it's, you know, you gotta be hip.
somewhere in Norwich, Chef, trying to trying to knock it down. Uh, and yeah, with with me, it's not about jazz vocabulary, but I can't not call myself a jazz musician. That's where I come from. And in fact, the older styles, the, the older jazz thing, as much as I want to push myself out, uh, it, it, as much as I, I want to be able to be relevant in contemporary environments, both rhythmic and harmonic, uh, and, and sometimes I can get there. You know, wh whether it's, excuse me, like more contemporary pop tunes or even to some extent contemporary jazz, you know, sometimes I, by getting there means I can, you know, I can hang on and I can do do something. Yeah, I like that. But you know, when I'm playing, when I'm playing a, a, a gig and it's kind of steeped in the classic jazz thing, and it's just like the well just goes deep, man. That's where my heart is, and that's what I got to do. I got to play from here. I had such a great time on my gig on Saturday night. Uh, the DCLX All Stars. That's DC meaning you know Washington DC. Lindy Exchange. It's a big like little Lindy Hop dancers, and oh my goodness, oh my goodness. If you can see the post that Scott Silbert shared on his Facebook page, not his musician page, his personal page, and I'm going to post one of the pictures that will on uh, my musician page that will allow you to access this whole post. And you get down to the bottom and see the pictures of the, the, all the dancers, man. Uh, it's so heartwarming that that music that, that I love so much, that I used to play all the time decades ago, and the dancers, that now it's gone from the culture, but there's still this, you know, subculture so to speak where, where it's vital and, and pe people people are digging it and I can just like really play from my heart and it, it, there was a, a couple of the musicians that, there that night because I'm still like being introduced in that circuit uh, you know in in regional musician land which is kind of what I am uh, you know, I've done things in different parts of the country, and it looks like that's going to happen more now. And in, in past my life, it has as well. But but really, where my bread and butter is, where my network is, and where I make my most contribution is in the area closer to my home. Now, I'll make a distinction between local and regional, particularly in a rural area like where I live. And the local musicians are basically the ones who, you know, do most everything in their small pond. You know, but then you start developing other small ponds and the, then maybe some bigger ponds and then you're working a broader region. And I think that's a, that's the fairest way that the catalog me, you know, uh, in Philly area, the Wilmington, Delaware area, uh, Baltimore, Washington area. I used to do a lot more. I'm doing less now. And the Washington area has gotten away from me, but down in here in Delmarva and, and Rehoboth and then where I live, you know, so I'm, you know, through musicians I've become close to again, being reintroduced in, into the scene where I don't know the younger musicians and they don't know me. And it was really so much fun to just just play with uh with really great musicians. Well, one of the musicians in, in particular, a, a young a young musician. Oh my goodness, what a great player. And he was just like, we, we were, we have our little mutual admiration society going on, you know? Uh, and that's where my heart is. And I would like to think in my idealistic world that no matter what somebody's litmus test is, that there will be a point in whatever somebody does in their own world that I don't meet like their voc litmus says vocabulary, but I can I can get it deep enough in my own space that it'll be acknowledged that I'm doing something, you know, and it, it, of, of of value. I think most people would say that even if they would be dismissive of it, you know. Uh, but it's like that's where I am. I just keep being drawn back to that, you know. And, you know, it's never going to be the point where I am going to uh, pacify everybody's scorecard. 
because I'm not a cerebral guy. This has been a meander fest. I'm going to have to listen to this and see if I'm making any sense at all. Fortunately, I've got a few days that I could re-record it. But if I'm making sense of all, I'm going to leave it here. Or even if I'm just making sense some of the time, I'm going to, I'm going to leave it here. And hopefully there is something about it that's interesting or useful. And I'd love to get your response and reaction. You know, which you can do in the comments or you can message me on, on Facebook or in email. And listen with your heart. Play from your heart. Live from your heart. Surrender to your heart and surrender your heart. Don't make your heart about yourself. Don't shut off your heart. See the bigger picture. See beyond yourself. And shine your light. Thanks so much.